Thank you guys for doing that. I appreciate it. And, um, I, you know, it's been a hard week here for me, to some, which is fine. It's just part of the gig, and I'm just grateful to be here with you guys this morning. I'm grateful to be a part of how God is working in his church, in his church. I am so thankful for the way that he is working on our staff, his staff, and I'm just so thankful I his son. And it's just comforting to know that he is always there and moving and teaching and speaking and loving us. Amen? Because we're all his children and he is our father. And we all share that together. And identity in Jesus. May we be a church unified in Jesus. And I pray this all of the time over our church and staff. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to, it won't mean that we're going to 100% of agree 100% of the time. Possible. Um, you know, for example, if you know someone named Chuck Noah, who I see his wife right there, he is a 49ers fan. <laughs> Oof. And some of you in the room, or maybe a lot of you in the room, like a movie that is my least favorite movie of all time the terrible acting, and the terrible written script, and that movie is called Fireproof. Okay, good. That, that means that you guys don't like it either or you haven't seen it. Don't. Okay? Because it's, it's not that good. And I thought I was going to like a bigger reaction, but I guess not. Good. And we just don't agree. Some of us are Democrats even. Some of us don't eat pork, whatever it is. We can't agree on everything and it's okay. But we do agree on one thing, the thing, that Jesus is our savior and it is because of him that we are here. Amen? And, you know, as we introduce ourselves and I make you do that, getting to know each other and welcoming in folks, it helps with that unity. And I really, really wanna know what all the places are that you, your favorite place to visit, but we don't have time to go through one by one. So on the count of Everyone's going to yell out their place, okay? One, two, three. Come on, the lake. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, there you go. That's a good one. So my place is Wisconsin. And I'm going to, um, oop, it says disconnected. Uh-oh. Right away, I was so confident of all this. Shoot. Well, my favorite place is Wisconsin, and in particular, northern Wisconsin. I don't, oh, there we go. Here it comes. And um, if, you, if you know that part of the country very well, it's a, near a resort town called um, Minocqua, Wisconsin. And my dad's family has had a place up there since before I was born. And it's been a big part of my life growing up. And one of the best things about it is the summer weather. Um, it's just, it's just been really hot here in Kansas City in June. It just seems to be like sticky and gross. And um, I just love the weather up there. And my family, as my kids when they were younger, this picture actually, we just put a phone up like on a bench and it turned out and I loved it so much. We have it on our wall at home. But um, it's up there. And it's funny, the older I get, I feel like that's all I talk about is the weather. And... <laughs> I don't, I assume that's normal. I feel like it's lame, but like I, I go to the gym in the morning and I, I'm kind of on the same schedule as a lot of retired guys. And every time I overhear them talking about the weather, specifically rain, like they love rain. Like, can you believe that it hasn't rained in so long? Or when are we gonna get, it's just constant. Or the weathermen never know what they're talking about. Or haven't we had a really hot June? It's like that. Like, that's what I talk about. I'm 40. All my conversations will be about the stupid weather. So I don't know if you guys are like that, but tomorrow I'm driving up to Wisconsin, 700 miles away, and the high is supposed to be 70 degrees. And I'm so excited for that. Doesn't that sound awesome? And, um, but before that, Carrie, my wife, gets to enjoy me in a swimming suit. We're going to talk about <laughs> Philippians, okay? We're in Philippians chapter 2. 
And we have learned a lot of stuff in chapter in Philippians uh, from the author, who is Paul. And we're, we've gone through the first 11 verses. Very powerful stuff. And a lot of it revolves around humility. And we learned that Paul wants his church to have unity in a group of believers, and that unity is achieved through humility. And Paul calls it a lowliness of mind. And I've really been thinking a lot about that, low. And I love that phrase. And we learned that we can look to Jesus as our ultimate example of humility, of having a lowliness of mind. Because in his deity and all the perks that go along with, with deity, he left heaven. And he humbly submitted to God's will out of obedience. And he was put to death. All because he loves us. Every one of us, you and me, and he considered us more important than staying in heaven. And so Paul has given the Philippians and us a breathtaking portrayal of Jesus and what his actions mean. And last week, Jordan taught us, exalted Jesus. I know, this is like, this, if you know Jordan at all, this is perfect. But uh, he, and he, I think it also drives Jess crazy. But it, Jordan called it a playbook for Christianity, and I love it. And if we want to, and if we want to be like Jesus, this is it: humility, obedience, suffering, whatever that looks like to you, and death. And for most of us, it's not a literal death; it's a figurative death, like giving up what we want. And just like Jesus, God will exalt us. Our reward will be that God exalts us. Easy. But if you want to know more about that, watch last week's message. He goes through a lot of scripture. Um, you'll have to pause it probably. That's okay. Because um, the scripture, the way that he just pulls all different parts of the Bible is good. And we need to know that. We, because why? Bible is all related, working together, telling us one big story, all pointing us to Jesus. Okay? So that brings us to our text today. Just two verses. And we're going to start in verse 12. So then, and I kind of want to stop there, but I'll finish reading the verse. So then, like, doesn't that mean that, well, or therefore, that we should probably learn what brought us to that word, and we need a little bit of context to know what that means. But I'll read the whole verse. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, or in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, so then, why does Paul say, so then? For context, if we go back to verse 27 of, verse, uh, of chapter 1, it says, only conduct yourselves in a matter worthy Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. So he is reiterating and reaffirming the same thing in our chapter 2 verse, that the church is being obedient. Remember, Paul knows that there is some minor disunity in the Philippian church. And he knows this because someone from the Philippian church was attending to his needs while he was in prison. And being in prison back then was much different. Uh, it was much more brutal, obviously, but brutal things that happened. But it's different today because if you didn't have someone or some people to support you financially, you could die because very little rations, food or anything, was given to you by prisoner, two prisoners by the government. And thankfully, Paul had the Philippians and a man named Epaphroditus. Everyone say Epaphroditus. He was part of the church, and Epaphroditus could have been kind of like Paul's assistant. Very different than prisoners of today, but...
the example of obedience. And it's a, it's a, it's a good, I mean, it's just two words, so then, but it's good to, to talk about them because the Bible all works together. And if you just, if you don't pay attention sometimes, you can get the wrong information. But the Bible works. Okay, so then, as I told you before, my beloved fellow Christians in the church, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Uh-oh. Work out my salvation. You mean I have to earn it? I thought you said that I didn't have to do works to get salvation. I'm confused. That is why Paul is talking directly to Christians, because those questions would make sense coming from a non-believer, but the, the, they, the Philippians already know that you don't have to earn or work your way into salvation. He's talking to them. And can you see how this, if you just read those, this verse without any context, that it'd be twisted around to manipulate people and thinking that if you do this for the church, or if you give this much money to something, or if you whatever it is, fill in the blank, that you will be saved. But the church of Philippi already knew that grace is the only thing that saved them, period. It's just another example of why context is so important in understanding God's word. But we don't want to just skip over the work out your salvation part, because uh, it's a pretty big phrase, and, it, and we, want, we should know what that means. What does it mean? Because if we're honest... All of us at some point in our walk with Jesus have thought, if I can just do this, if I can just do that, or stop doing this, or stop doing that, then my salvation would be a little bit more secure. And I grew up in the 80s, and I would say that there was like a list of top 10 sins that if I could avoid, then I would be making my way into heaven at the end of my life. So top 10 sins, just a few examples. Don't drink alcohol. Don't smoke or do drugs. Don't cuss. And definitely don't listen to secular music. Only praise and worship music, like Jessica Duckworth's favorite, Darlene Check, Or Amy Grant, before she got divorced. Also one of the top 10 sins at that time. You know what I mean? And I hate the secular music one because I feel like whoever made that up <laughs> had never listened to the God-ordained, God-breathed, God-given music of Steve Perry and Journey. <laughs> the best band of all time. And you know, like there's truth in steering clear of things that are detrimental and things that are opposing to God's word. But avoiding a list of 10 sins is not our end goal of being a Jesus follower. Far from it. So the Philippians know that their salvation, that their serve, wow, the Philippians know that their salvation was complete because of what Jesus did for them and us. He hung on the cross and said, "It is finished." So why does Paul say working out our salvation? Paul is talking about spiritual growth, or another word that we use is called. Sanctification, sanctification. Everyone say sanctification. sanctification. Sanctification is the divine act of making the believer increasingly holy on a practical level. Making and increasing holy on a practical level. So it's a process, a work in progress. And sanctification is a process. It's becoming more and more holy, becoming more and more like Jesus is a process. And some of our, <laughs> I know mine is, initial reactions are like, I thought I didn't have to do anything. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me and then he paid for the penalty of my sins. I do. 
but now I have to be involved in a process? <laughs> when I was growing up, and I would say even up till five or six years ago, I kind of had this thought process. So when I was, I, accept, I wanted to accept, the, accept Jesus. I remember accepting him when I was 10 years old at Evangel off of the Highway 435 on Wednesday night. And it was right after they had some drama with puppets that made Jesus look awesome, you know? And I was like, I'm in. And I raised my hand and I asked God to be in my life. And I filled out the card and everything, you know? And I do believe at that time that I was saved, that God entered into, that Jesus entered into my life and that I was saved. I do believe that. So then the next thing, I, the next um, step would be, now I'm going to really try to follow the list of do's and don'ts that I've heard about so many times, which weren't hard at then because I didn't know where to get beer or cigarettes. <laughs> the worst cuss word I had said up until then was when I called my brother or sister a butt, you know? And if I was really mad, I'd tell them to shut up. Like that was it. That, and it wasn't that hard to follow the rules. And if I do that, I follow the list, I get to experience the awesomeness of Jesus that I heard about. The peace and the joy and the love because I deserved it. After all, I was following the rules, right? But I wasn't really doing anything to pursue him. There was nothing in my life that was helping my spiritual growth. I was going to church and hearing a 30-minute teaching about the Bible, but that was it. And so over the years, when that list of sins became harder to comply with, I didn't understand. I would be frustrated, and I, was, I would be mad about it. And I would, I turned into bitterness, because I, why wasn't I getting all the stuff that I was promised? Where was my joy? Where was my peace? Where was my reward? And the biggest question that it was hard for me to deal with was, what am I doing wrong? Does that sound familiar to anyone? I didn't understand how important the process of sanctification was. I didn't understand how important that there was more for me to be a part of than just receiving the good stuff. I think it would be important for us to discuss and understand what salvation means. When Paul says to work out our salvation, what exactly is salvation? And in the Bible, the, the salvation is represented in three different ways, past, present, and future. And we're gonna put like spiritual language next to all of them. So in the past, you're justified, you are saved immediately from the penalty of sin. Meaning at the point of our prayer to accept Jesus into our lives, we are receiving the free gift of grace and we don't have to pay our own price for our sin. That's awesome. In the present, we are saved progressively from the power and practice of sin, sanctified. In the future, we are saved ultimately from the presence of sin. We are glorified because we get to spend eternity in heaven with God apart from sin. Jordan touches on that last week. So the, the salvation we're talking in our verse about is sanctification. Sanctification of daily Christian living. And the Philippians not, were not to work for their salvation, but to work out their salvation. To progressively, or more and more, be saved from the power and practice of sin. For the Philippians, or any believer, our past salvation is the work God has already done in us, and then our present salvation is us working it out that he has already worked in. That's it. We work out what he has worked in. And that's a process. And another danger of not understanding the scripture and the context and how it all works together is we've already learned that you could manipulate Paul's words to say that you have to work for your salvation. And you could twist Paul's other words, in Romans, to say that after you become a Christian, you don't have to do anything. That you can just sit around and wait for your time. Wait for the time it is for you to enter into heaven. That you can be passive and sit quietly. Let go and let God, right? Mm -hmm. Romans 10.10 10 says this. Paul says, for with the heart a person believes, 
resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And this is true, this verse is. And it's referring to our justification. But without knowing more, which we're not going to go into the context in this Romans, it would be easy to say that this is it. That, that all we have to do is believe and confess. And then you have completed everything you need to do. But guess what? The Bible is a story. All working together. And we know that there is more. And so does Paul. Which is why he tells the Philippians that working out their salvation requires effort. This sanctification requires effort. Okay, Jeremy. We get it. It takes effort. We should be putting in effort. Fine. Just tell us what that effort is. Okay, I will. But first, I want to talk about the last couple um, words in this verse. It says, with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What does this mean? What does this mean? And without knowing anything else, if you just took out that phrase with fear and trembling, wouldn't you conclude that we're supposed to be fearful? That we should be scared of doing the wrong thing all the time? Or we should be walking on eggshells and hoping that we don't get in trouble? No. That's not what it means. We serve a God of peace and joy. Philippians is the joy book of the Bible, and Paul is talking about fear and trembling. Paul is for referring to a reverent fear and trembling, meaning that because God has done so much for us, because he has saved us from the depths, because he is patient with us, and because he loves us, that we're in awe of that, everything that he's done. And we realize that we need to do our part. And fear and trembling is the idea that we are doing our best very best to fulfill our part, to do our part in sanctification. So what is a part? What's the effort? You want to know? Sanctification is spiritual growth through spiritual practices. And you can probably guess what some of these spiritual practices are. Here's a couple. Prayer, and reading the Bible. And kind of when I was growing up, this was it. It's like, if you do these two things, you'll be fine. And there's truth in some of that. There is truth in that. But there are more. I'm going to put up some more. Fasting, Sabbath, solitude, community, service, sharing the gospel, and generosity. And you guys, these aren't like arbitrary. They're not random these are all things that Jesus regularly did and that his disciples regularly did and that the early church regularly did, that I regularly do. That's how we grow spiritually. I do these things because Jesus did these things and I want to be like Jesus. And to be honest, they're hard sometimes and I am better at some than others. And some of them were designed to be with other people, to be, share with other people, to do them together. And it's slow. Sanctification, spiritual growth is slow. It's designed to be that way. There are times when I, I kind of tell people sometimes my spiritual growth is like stair steps. You know what I mean? And sometimes the steps are like tiny and then sometimes it's a huge step, and there's truth in that, and it's okay. If you have like 300 tiny steps, and it can be like, what's happening? At least you're taking a step, and sometimes we're like, I don't wanna draw on this because I don't wanna mess it up. Sometimes the step is like, you're taking a stair like this, and then like you kind of seem like you're like staying on the same floor for a long time, and that's true. It's slow, is my whole point, you know? And if you're thinking, man, <laughs> I can't do these things. I can't keep adding to my schedule and adding to my list to do's. I mean, I love Jesus and I want to know him more, man, but I'm tired. I'm overworked, overcommitted, overwhelmed. I have two little kids. They take up a lot of time. My marriage isn't going that great. 
I got to work on that. I'm still single and alone. I have a stressful job. I know. Me too. But guess what? God knows all that. So he has the answer for us. Verse 13. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Paul now shows us the other side of sanctification, that it isn't reliant on us, that our working out isn't what's fueling this. God is at work in us, and that's what the fuel is. He is the one who began the work and continue to work in us. He is the one who will be along all those steps. He is the one that through our entire process of sanctification, he will be fueling it, fueling it. And he has given us the Holy Spirit to conform all believers, you and me, to the image of his son, Jesus. It's him. So Dallas Willard, if you know who that is, he defines spiritual growth as this. The spirit-driven process of forming the inner world of the human self in such a way that it becomes like the inner being of Christ himself. Now, some of that sounds like psychology or, to quote a movie, new age hooey-fooey. That, that, there's truth in this whole thing, but the, the most important part is the first part of that sentence, the spirit-driven process. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And if you're a believer, you have that. You're not gritting your way through stuff. And if we want to be like Christ, I want to be like Christ. But it starts with him. And it has started with him if you're a believer. He started to work in us. And we begin to work it out. And he carries the load. God works in, we begin to work it out. He, can, he carries us. He begins to transform us. So we continue to pursue him. And then he shows us more and more. And he changes us slowly, gently, sometimes not so gently. And then we are compelled to continue to grow because we are in awe of that. We are in awe of what he has done for us and what he's shown us. But it's not done. He shows us more and more. He works in us more. We work it out. And it's just goes around and around. We grow closer to him. And there's always more. We serve a God of more. Not because we're strong enough. Not because we're smart enough. Because it is for his good pleasure at the end of that. So, as I finish, you might be thinking, and I'm going to ask you to start practicing that long list of stuff. No. Actually, I want you to stop doing something. I want you to stop gritting your way through any of the practices you may be doing right now. And I want you to stop running around each day like a crazy person. I want you to take two minutes when you wake up or when you go to work or when you're at lunch or right before you go to bed doesn't matter. Two minutes. And I want you to set a timer for two minutes. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to take three deep breaths in, deep breaths out. Thank God for today. Ask him to speak to you and start the timer. And listen. Don't talk. Just listen every day for seven days. And your mind's gonna race, and it might be awkward, and you might have negative or yucky thoughts. That's okay. Keep at it. Next Sunday, I want you to tell someone about your experience, or in the middle of the week, tell someone about it. And it's totally fine if it was awful, or if you didn't hear anything from God. The important part is posturing yourself like Jesus did to hear from God, his creator, your creator, okay? I'll be right there doing the same thing with you. That's what I'm asking you to do. Do less. Seek God.
So we're going to take communion. And if we are following Jesus and want to be like him, it's important to remember what he did for us. He left heaven, walked among us, died and rose again because he loves us. The prayer team is going to be down here beneath the screens. And if you need prayer for anything, anything at all, please let someone in your church family pray for you. If you're joyful this morning and just want to pray a prayer of praise, if you are longing to hear God's voice on something, if you feel stuck in your spiritual growth, anything at all, come and get prayer. They're gonna the prayer team is going to come down, and they're going to take communion first if they want to, because there's extra communion in the front. Let them do that first, and then they'll be available, okay? Let's pray. Father, man, thank you that you're always there and that you're always working, that you're fueling our growth, that it is you and your spirit that lives inside of us that helps us to keep going. Not that it's going to be perfect. Not that it's not going to have hard times. But that you're always there working. Help us to know that each and every day. As we surrender our lives to you each and every day as a church. May you be sanctifying us. Help us to work out what you have already worked in. And we thank you for loving us, even when we don't work out our salvation, even when we don't feel like you're close at all. Thank you that you're there anyway, because we believe you and we trust you, even when it's hard. We remember what you did for us today. We remember that you died for us and that because of that, the work in us, we can work out. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.